Hello, my name is Mark Murphy. I'm a GP in the Department of General Practice in the Royal College of Surgeons. This brief video, ECGs in General Practice, is designed to support SC1 students in their rotation in General Practice. This video will outline the background to the 12 lead ECG, will outline how to perform an ECG, and will then discuss how to interpret an ECG. An ECG measures the electrical conductance activity of the heart by placing electrodes on the skin. As an example, imagine two electrodes, one positive, one, one negative. They will assess the electrical activity through the heart in each cardiac cycle. Each cardiac cycle is represented by a series of waveforms. The first wave is called the P wave and represents the depolarization of the atria and their contraction. The second complex waveform is called the QRS complex, and represents the depolarization of the ventricles and their contraction. The third waveform is called the T wave and represents the repolarization of the ventricles. Between the waves are intervals. The first interval outlined above is the P or interval. It represents the delay in conduction between the atria and ventricles because of the AV node. The second interval outlined above is the QT interval. A 12 lead ECG is made from 10 electrodes placed in the skin. Like a traffic light, a red, yellow and green electrode is placed on the right arm, left arm and left leg and a fourth electrode is placed on the right leg. Firstly, the limb leads. On a 12 lead ECG piece of paper, the first lead, lead 1, is placed in the top left. It represents the electrical conductance through the heart as seen between the left arm electrode and the right arm electrode. Thus you can see its vector is roughly 0 degrees. Lead 2 represents the electrical conductance between the left leg and the right arm. Lead 3 between the left leg and the, le and the left arm. There are three augmented limb leads. They are formed by the creation of a central terminal, a confluence of two of the limb electrodes, and this is the negative electrode in the lead. AV or represents the electrical conductance between the central terminal and the right arm, which in this case is positive. AVL represents the conductance between the central terminal and the left arm. An AVF, roughly 90 degrees inferior, represents the conductance between the left leg electrode and the central terminal. Thus, six leads have been created by four electrodes on the skin. It is also worth considering that lead 1 and AVL are called the lateral leads because they reflect the electrical conductance towards the left lateral arm. Leads 2, AVF and 3 are called the inferior leads because they reflect the electrical conductance inferiorly. Moving on to the 6 pricordial or chest leads, again they use a negative terminal which is a confluence of limb electrodes. Between this negative terminal, there are six leads placed on the skin on the chest. V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. Beneath the 12 lead ECG is a rhythm strip, which typically is represented by lead two. This 12 lead ECG represents normal sinus rhythm. One box represents 0.2 of a second, so five boxes represents one second. In RCSI, you will get lots of practice performing ECGs in general practice and at the practical procedure workshop. In RCSI, we recommend placing the electrodes in the following locations. The limb leads should all be equidistant to the proximal limb, and the electrodes for V1 to V6 should be located in these locations. When the electrodes are placed in the correct part of the body, you should then attach the leads to each electrode then turn on the ECG machine and then print the 12 lead ECG. We will now move on to analysis or interpretation of an ECG. Whilst it's important to comment on the most obvious feature which you see on an ECG, it is important to have a system. We will go through the ECG according to rate, rhythm, ischemia, axis, intervals and the hypertrophy. Firstly, rate. There are several ways to calculate the heart rate on an ECG. 
the rate might be automatically provided as part of an automatic ECG. However, this should not be assumed. You must know how to calculate the rate. One method is to count the number of boxes between each QRS complex or the OR interval. If you divide this number into 300, you will get the heart rate. As an example, if there are three boxes between each QRS, dividing 300 by three would equal 100 beats per minute. Another example would be to count the number of QRS complexes over a period of six seconds on a 12 lead ECG strip and multiply this by 10 to get the rate in one minute. As an example, this is a rhythm strip. Counting over six seconds, one would then count the number of QRS complexes within the six second strip, in this case seven. Seven multiplied by 10 is 70 beats per minute. Moving on to rhythm. The rhythm can either be regular, irregularly irregular, or regularly irregular. As an example, this 12 lead ECG and its rhythm strip below show an irregularly irregular rhythm and no P waves. This is atrial fibrillation. This next 12 lead ECG shows a broad complex tachycardia, in this case, ventricular tachycardia. Moving on to ischemia. Acute ischemic changes include, firstly, T-wave inversion, ST depression, or ST elevation. This is important because it represents transmural infarction. An ST elevation myocardial infarction is treated differently in terms of thrombolysis and intervention. You must also be aware that there may be old ischemic changes on ECGs, such as established Q waves. With ischemic changes, you must be able to localize this, the ischemic changes through contiguous leads. As we have discussed, there are inferior leads, lateral leads, anterior leads, and septal leads. It is important to characterize any ischemic changes to certain contiguous leads which represents certain parts of the myocardium. This 12 lead ECG demonstrates ST elevation in lead two, three, and AVF. So this is an ST elevation MI in the inferior leads. In terms of axis, we've already discussed the limb leads and the augmented limb leads, and we've inferred that they have a vector associated with each lead. If we graphically represent the vectors as such, lead one and lead AVF being zero and 90 degrees, and the other leads as so. We know that a normal cardiac axis is between minus 30 degrees and plus 90 degrees. Left axis deviation is beyond minus 30 degrees, and right axis deviation is beyond plus 90 degrees. There are two methods to calculating the axis. The first method uses two leads, AVF and one. If the QRS complex of AVF is predominantly positive, we know that the axis is in the lower half of the following diagram. By positive, we mean that the OR wave is bigger than the S wave. Thus, in this case, we know the axis is towards AVF in the lower half of this diagram. Similarly for lead one. If the QRS of lead one is predominantly positive, we know that the cardiac axis is in the right half of this diagram. If the QRS of AVF is predominantly positive and the QRS of lead one is positive, the axis will be between zero and 90 degrees. The second method for calculating the cardiac axis involves isolating the most isoelectric QRS complex between the limb and augmented limb leads. By isoelectric, we mean that lead in which the OR wave roughly equals the S wave. For example, imagine lead AVL is the most isoelectric lead. The cardiac axis is the same as that vector which is 90 degrees perpendicular to the most isoelectric lead in a positive direction. Taking this example, AVL is the most isoelectric lead. The lead which is 90 degrees perpendicular to this is lead two, and it is in the direction of a positive lead two if the OR wave is greater than S for lead two. Thus, the cardiac axis is plus 60 degrees. Moving on to intervals. 
The first common interval calculated in general practice is the PR interval. It is very important in a bradycardia to calculate the PR interval to outrule first, second, or third degree heart block. Another common interval calculated, particularly in terms of drug monitoring, is the QTC interval. This is important in terms of prescribing medications such as citalopram, domperidone, and some antipsychotics. Other items and intervals we could look out for would be analysis of the QRS complex, for example, with right bundle or left bundle branch block. Lastly, in general practice, particularly in terms of hypertension monitoring, left ventricular hypertrophy is often looked for. One mechanism involves looking at V2 and V5. If the S wave of V1 and the R wave of V5 or V6 is over 35 small boxes or millimeters, this is suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. This concludes this summary video of ECGs in general practice. Thank you.